This episode is brought to you in part by Audible, the leading provider of downloadable audiobooks. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash ATP to learn more. Linode, Linode, uh, I hate... Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Linus, Linux, uh, mm-hmm. Linus, uh, oh, there's so many, so many problems. Mm-hmm. Are we allowed to do follow-up? Why not? Sure, why not? John, have you licensed the term to us? Yeah, you haven't been getting my bills? <laughs> <laughs> my rates are very, very reasonable. Funny, I've been getting them. Yeah. All right, so this first bit is just somebody posted something on app.net whose username is J-A-S-T-E, but I don't know if that's the real name or handle or whatever. I believe it's anyway, pronounced Jaste. You think so, but who knows. Uh, this is about, it's an iWatch follow-up, and it's he thinks that the iWatch will be Apple's foray into identity, and this is an aspect of the watch that we didn't talk about in the last show, and I think it's worth talking about, uh, and the identity problem in general. Like, the concept is that the thing that you wear on your wrist will somehow identify you to all the other things that you come in contact with, to your television set, I guess to your phone, if you wanted to pay for something at it it Starbucks, you wave your wrist by it or something like that. Uh, I don't think there's anything special about the watch that makes it more possible to be your source of identity than, say, the phone. We all have phones now, and if we were going to have some sort of device be your source of identity, it would have been the phones by now. And lots of people have tried to do that in various ways. Uh, so this idea is that maybe maybe the phone is too big or too expensive or the battery doesn't last long enough or you have to dig it out of your pocket or something else. So this would be slightly more accessible than to give us another crack at making this magical identity thing where our identification is securely carried around with us by this little physical dongle. And when you sit down at your computer, it detects that you are you because you're the one wearing the watch and it automatically unlocks your screen and logs you in and... Uh, when you walk into a room, it plays the music that you like, and it, it puts things on your tab when you swipe it, when you buy things at stores. This is the fantasy scenario, and I think the barriers to that are, you know, not technological. They're business-related, where this payment processors camped out at every possible place that want to give you money, and maybe standards-related, where if you want the same little dongle to do all these different functions throughout your house, everything you own has to be created by the same company and purchased recently, because even if Apple rolled this out, it wouldn't work with all past Apple hardware, probably. You'd have to get new stuff, or at the very least, you'd need to update software. So I think this scenario will continue to be a fantasy, but while nothing is actually announced, this is the time to indulge in that fantasy, I suppose. So this person basically just wants to enable the uh, pictures on the wall from the movie Antitrust. Did you ever see that abomination? I did not. Oh, you should. It's Ryan Felipe, Philippi or whatever, and Tim Robbins. Uh, Tim Robbins basically plays Bill Gates and Ryan Philippi, Philippe, whatever, is uh, a crack programmer. And so they go into, quote unquote, Bill Gates' house. And as he goes in between rooms, like the the... The lights dim to a certain level, and the pictures on the wall, which are all like LCD displays, show different pictures. And I think this was based on something that Jobs supposedly had in his mansion, or excuse me, not Jobs, uh, Gates had in his mansion. But uh, the the theory being that this watch could kind of enable that. In other words, it's always on you, and just like you said, it's always personalized to you. And it would be like lower power than a phone, so I guess it wouldn't run out of charge as easily. Right. um... I don't really see this happening in that way with watches. I mean, I, rather, I don't, I don't see watches changing anything. You know, I, I think, first of all, one big problem with this is that I think there's going to be a lot more phones than watches out there. And, you know, my theory from the last episode was that the watch would really just be a phone accessory and, and that it wouldn't, you know, I don't know if I outright said it, but, I, I, but my, my theory here is that it wouldn't be anything by itself. You know, it's, it'd be like a Bluetooth headset with no device. Like it, it, it would just be, you know, communicating over Bluetooth, low energy, and uh, it would just be a peripheral to your iPhone or maybe iPad um, and, and maybe iPod Touch, which would be interesting. But, um, you know, for all the reasons why we don't yet have this magical automatic identity thing with these devices, I think all those same reasons are going to continue to make it impossible um, for us to have that with watches also, or, or rather impractical uh, for us to have that with watches. Um, all the same reasons apply. You have 
weird privacy and security issues. You have a, a big boil the ocean problem. Uh, you have a lot of just weird, you know, incompatibilities in reality because it wouldn't, you know, in reality it wouldn't be one company making all these things that all work together. You know, you would have, you know, w- look what you have now. You have Apple doing pretty well with the iPhone, but then you still have Android. You still have Windows Phone. You still have all the, all these other things. You have of all the people who have iPhones, a small portion of them have Macs, but a lot more of them have Windows PCs. And some of them have iPads and some of them don't. And, and so, and people who have Macs sometimes have Android devices. People who have iPads sometimes have an Android phone. There's, there's, there's this giant diverse environment that things would have to work in these days. And for something like identity to work that well and to be that ubiquitous, I think it would, you'd have to have one company so dominant in the field that it could make everything for almost everybody. And I don't think we're going to have that uh, for at least the next decade and, and hopefully longer because we're better off not having that. Hey, you know, this segues somewhat somewhat well, uh, something you said a moment ago, uh, it segues somewhat well to a post that my friend Eric Wielander wrote. Um, the post, which I'm pasting in the chat, um, l- let me kind of take you on a little mental journey. Um, so we talked last episode about, you know, w- what is the thing that I wa- that this iWatch is solving? And also, you know, what's the challenge of it? And the challenge is that there's really not a lot of input that can go into this and also not a lot of output that you can get from it. And so, you know, what already fixes that? And Eric pointed out, well, Siri could be a good answer for that. And I think part of the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm so excited at the thought of a Dick Tracy watch, which I joked about at the end of the last episode. But the thought being, hey, you know, Siri could solve a lot of these problems about an input-output for an iWatch. And the other thing that occurred to me that Eric didn't bring up was uh, Eddie Q during the keynote at about an hour and 42 minutes said something about how, hey, Siri's going to have a little more control over the things the phone can do. And the example he used, I think, was thing, were things like brightness and uh, one or two other things, maybe even Bluetooth, which maybe wouldn't be relevant in terms of an iWatch. But I thought it was an interesting idea that perhaps some sort of really Siri-based integration could work well with a watch. Now, on the other side of the coin, to argue with myself and with Eric, I don't know if a Dick Tracy watch, as much as I joke and say I want it, would be a really socially acceptable thing. I think that would be a little awkward if we all walked around talking to our to our wrists. But then again, we all walk around staring down at our crotches. So I guess it can only be, but so bad. I guess my problem with so much of this is is you know basically why don't we have this now? Like what what's stopping us from doing this with phones already? Because really, with when it comes to things like capturing input and having sensors and everything. Uh, the phone already covers pretty much all of this area. There's there's not a whole lot of ground that a phone in your pocket or bag or jacket doesn't really cover. Uh, there and and there are you know some certainly there's some things. There's things like biometric information, pedometer style things. You know the, those are things that the phone either doesn't reliably have or uh, or or just can't get practically. But uh, unless you you know press it against your naked leg all the time or something that, that would be kind of <laughs> I'm sure somebody does <laughs> there's a lot of people with iPhones but uh, for most of these things that we think of as oh we, will the watch allow us to do X Y and Z almost all of them you could do with a phone and we aren't doing with phones and I think it's worth asking why and and looking at it with some healthy skepticism of well if this isn't working with phones or if we're not doing this yet with phones. There's probably a really good reason for that, and it's probably not going to change if we have a microphone or some sensors or an e-ink screen or anything else stuck to our wrist instead of in our pockets. The Siri thing is weird, though, because I don't see how it could ever provide an experience that's, that's even as good as it is on the phone because it would have to communicate with the phone to do the Siri thing. So it would be like using Siri on your phone, which already is not snappy only delayed by one more hop because it's not like the phone is going to talk to the Siri service itself. It's not going to have, you know, 3G wireless is going to be talking to the phone. The phone is going to be talking to the Siri service and then, you know, playing this little game of uh, relay back and forth. Uh, And it has all the same problems as Siri. You know, say something, hopefully wait uh, as you stare at it and wait to see how it interpreted or misinterpreted what you said and then wait for an answer. It is not a, a snappy experience. That's even ignoring, like, the whole how do you feel about talking to yourself type of thing. I do not see people, you know, people use Siri as a game when you're conversing with it and then use it for very focused tasks 
uh, rarely, and I don't see them. Maybe they feel like they need to do it in private, but people tell me, oh, I use it to set reminders or I use it to answer text messages when I'm in the car or whatever. But those are all times when they're not with somebody. All your know? friends are secretly using Siri when you aren't around. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, not, yeah, because they, you know, people feel more comfortable talking to their thing and using speech recognition when no one is in the room. Even when I do speech recognition to, like, write my articles for, for a dictation, it's more comfortable to do that when no one is in the room hearing you say fragments of sentences and issue voice commands, you know? Oh, yeah. I, I would definitely say also uh, that, you know, whenever I have to use Siri in public, I, I will usually try to use it as quietly as possible. And often I will do the thing where I pick up the phone and put it to my ear because most people don't know that also triggers Siri. Uh, with the, prox- the the proximity sensor, um, and you can just, right. then just talk into it like so. It looks almost like you're talking to somebody on the phone, uh, like you're giving a command to your secretary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in a very stern voice. <laughs> we Nearby are. restaurants. <laughs> Remind me to tell my wife I love her when I get home. Yes. Yeah, anyway, like that, uh, goodness. Um, okay. uh, anyway, so I mean. Do, is there anything really new that we think about the watch now? I mean, one thing we we got an interesting article also by response. I got to put this in the uh, in the notes. I lost it, but um, somebody basically outlined what Bluetooth Low Energy does and and what what it makes possible and and why it's so much better. And uh, in the context, in response to our episode last week, in the context of the uh, of the iWatch, and or uh, I hope it's. I hope it's not called that just because it, the name is already starting to sound stupid in my head. Anyway, yeah, I agree. <laughs> it probably, I mean, the, all those trademark applications. I mean, I thought iPad was stupid too. And MacBook, ugh, terrible name. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, uh, I really do hope that, uh, that if this exists, it's either a very small scale thing at first, like the Apple TV now, which is like, you know, all, everyone was so excited. Apple can release something for TV and then they release the Apple TV as we know it today, which is like, Okay, it's nice, but it's a pretty small scale problem solver, and uh, and so you know the, if they make a watch, it could be that, right? It could just be doing things that are very similar to what the Pebble and the other things like that do now, which is basically showing notifications on the watch and uh, and maybe having some minor sensors like a like a Fitbit or Fuel Band equivalent, but not doing a whole lot else, not having a microphone for Siri, you know, maybe maybe they add those things later on, but just starting out with a nice, simple problem set they can do really well with all the existing hardware and uh, and have great battery life and not be this giant bulky thing on your wrist, not look ugly, not look like a, you know, a nerd convention happening on your wrist, and, uh, and just do that really well. I hope that's what they do, um, because I don't, you know, looking at everything else, all the things they could possibly do that would be all these crazy transformative ideas... Um, it seems like for a lot of them, they have extremely fatal practical or technological uh, restrictions that would really prevent them from being good. Yeah, and the more I think about the iWatch, the more I keep coming back to, I feel like the only way it's going to be really interesting, well, I don't know, I still think the only way it's going to be really interesting is if it aggregates sensors in a new and clever way. Let me give you a couple examples. So in the original iPhone, as opposed to having to hit a button to rotate the screen from portrait to landscape, it added an accelerometer in order to do that automatically. In order to prevent um, cheek dialing somebody or cheek hanging up on someone, it had a proximity sensor in order to turn off the display and turn off the touch input when the thing is up against your head. And maybe that's not aggregation in the strictest sense, but I feel like taking sensors that we have today, like a Fitbit or something like it, and taking either new sensors or the existing sensors and and putting that data together in a new and interesting way, that's what I feel like an iWatch would do that would differentiate it. But how specifically? I don't have the faintest idea. You know what Samsung would do with the iWatch? Copy it. No, they would, they, they would make it so that when you use, you know, the Samsung iPad equivalent, whatever that is, you could wave your hand in front of it without actually contacting the screen to do gestures because it would have an accelerometer <laughs> on, your, on your wrist. Uh, they already do things sort of like that with a single device, but once you have two of them, you have to sort of start thinking like Nintendo. Okay, well, I've got a sensor on my wrist, and there's a screen over here, and if I wave my hand, this is not, you know, that the sensor can recognize my gestures without me physically interacting with the other device and use it, you know, that type of thing. I assume Apple would pass on most things like that because non-contact UIs are not particularly uh, nice feeling, but guaranteed Samsung would do it just because it's possible. 
They seem to try every anything that's technically possible. Well, try it out. Ship it on a device. See if people like it. Exactly. I mean, does it, do you know they when they launched? What, what was the most recent one? The S three. Uh, S four. Whatever. Okay. So whatever the most recent one was. Remember the and it had those. It had, it had like the hover feature. It had the tilt scrolling and all those all these crazy things. The, the eyeball tracking to see when you're looking at the video. Yes. Pause yes. It when yes. you're not like you know if we can sort of do it, ship it. Does anybody? I mean, you, we heard a lot about those when it was launched. I haven't heard a thing about them or actually well, or they that have phone to be, since They have then. to be awful because like if if they were if they had if any of them had passed the threshold into being so reliable that they're really useful, they would quickly spread elsewhere. But they, the one if you don't see them everywhere else, it means that the technology to do that is not quite ready. So the eyeball thing, like if that was reliable enough and that it felt better than actually hitting a play pause button, it would be everywhere. But it's not because it's not that reliable yet. Yeah. Well, let's go to things that are reliable. Talk about our first sponsor today. It's the Transporter. This is a repeat sponsor, and you've they, they sponsored a lot of great shows recently, and uh, so you've probably heard about this already. But we're going to tell you about it anyway because it's that good. Uh, plus, they bought two sponsorships. Uh, so the Transporter <laughs> is this pretty cool device. So the idea is your own kind of it's like a it's like a private cloud storage drive. You you have this physical device. It's a little. It's like basically a hard drive enclosure with some cool software and a network port. So here's how this works: you you buy this thing from them. Um, you can either get it empty for two hundred bucks, you put in your own two and a half inch drive, or you can get a one terabyte version for three hundred bucks, or a two terabyte version for four hundred bucks. And by the way, before I forget, you can go to filetransporter.com/atp to look this stuff up. And you can get 10% off of those prices, which saves a lot. You know, it's 40 bucks off the two terabyte one. 10% off uh, by using coupon code ATP in their store. So let me tell you why you want this thing. We all use Dropbox. And I mentioned last time that, you know, it really takes balls for a company who's competing with Dropbox in some way um, to directly call out Dropbox and say, look, we know you use it. We're not going to pretend like they don't exist. Here's what here's how we're different and here's why you might want to use us instead or in addition. So with this hard drive enclosure that they sell you, they it comes with a web service that will relay traffic for you, but everything is private. All your data is stored on that drive that's in your possession. It's in your physical possession. All the traffic if you if you access it from everywhere else and you can do that, you can have Different transporters, you, you and your friend can have one. You can do like an off-site backup with your friend's house or your workplace or your parents' house or whatever. And you can share files with people and you can share folders with people. And all of that is by invitation only. You control it, what, who sees it and what kind of access they have. And everything's encrypted end-to-end. So nobody, not transporter staff, not anybody listening in the middle, <clears throat> NSA, nobody can see what you're transferring between the two drives because it's encrypted end-to-end. And all you got to do is buy the drive, and then for life, you have access to the service that relays things and tracks it for you. So it does some really awesome cloud-like things, sharing and encryption and transfer and mirroring to other drives if you want to, all these things without having to lock the files up on someone else's servers and deal with the security ramifications thereof. You might be required, for instance, by regulations or by client contracts to keep files in your possession. Uh, this makes collaboration so much easier in that kind of in that kind of situation. So, Transporter, it's easy. It's private cloud sharing, and there's so many things you can do with it. Yeah, I mentioned offsite backup before collaboration. A lot of people that I know use it to to send audio files to each other for podcasts. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of other things you can do with it. Um, so really, and, and I, these guys are so nice. They keep sending us free transporters, and, and it's, it's awesome. They're, they're making this new 2.0 software that's adding a bunch of features. Um, Drobo recently acquired them. So they, and, and in fact, it's fa- founded by ex-Drobo employees. So, uh, so you know, they really know what they're doing with storage stuff. And uh, it's really a, a great company to watch, great product to use. So check out Transporter. Go to filetransporter.com slash ATP. Uh, and once again, use code ATP in their store to get 10% off of their already awesome prices. And really, it's it's as easy as sending an invitation to anyone you want to share a file with, or you can keep your files private and have everything encrypted and awesome. It's really just a fantastic product. And uh, thanks a lot to File Transporter. Casey, you've had one of these things. Indeed. Um, and they are, it is really nice. It really is. 
It's it's pretty much exactly like Dropbox, but rather just like you said, rather than being in the cloud, it's in my possession. So if for some reason I ever wanted this stuff not to be on the internet, well, not to say that it's on the internet, but so to speak, if I if I ever wanted it to be inaccessible from the internet, even by myself, I remove the Ethernet jack and suddenly there's nothing anyone can do to get to it. Now, granted, the NSA has already read all of it anyway, but in <laughs> principle. No, they can't. Well, no, I'm saying at, at before this point, the NSA has read everything. But once I remove the Ethernet jack, there's nothing they can do to read it. <laughs> Shy of coming to my house. Please don't come to my house. <laughs> They're already in your house, Casey. Come on. They probably are. <laughs> So yeah, thanks so, a no, lot to really, transport. It really is nice. Yeah, it's it's a great concept. It's a great device, and you know I'm a big fan of as I've I've written about a lot recently. I'm a big fan of owning your own stuff online, uh, of being in control of everything, and and sure there there's a place for Dropbox, uh, but there's there's a lot of situations where you feel a lot better having your own stuff. Plus, I mean, heck, what would two terabytes on, on Dropbox cost you? You know, there's there's a cost advantage here too, and and you know, Transporter they have they have software that integrates with Mac OS that it provides a lot of the same conveniences as, as the Dropbox software. You have the folder integration, the finder integration, the share links, everything like that. Um, all of that, but with with a drive you control, it it really is fantastic. It's a great idea for a product, and I'm I'm very very happy that they made it. All right, so moving along, thanks Transporter. Um, John, you mentioned last week uh, in the after show strange ways that real people use iOS. <laughs> I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Sure. This is based on my uh, recent vacation to see family. And since the last time I visited, it seems like all of them got iPhones, uh, usually like 4Ss, 4s, you know, the, the, the less expensive iPhones. I didn't see any iPhone 5s. And I, I noticed a little bit of this at WRADC strange ways that other developers use iPhones, but seeing how regular people use them, because they don't have any, they don't have any circle of people that to give them sort of the social norms of how you use an iPhone. Uh, and here are the things that I noticed right away. The first thing, and this is the one I noticed at WWC as well, is I didn't see anybody who filled their screens with icons, the springboard screens. And up until very recently, Everyone I saw filled their screens because your first screen, you'd fill it with icons. And when you ran out of room, you go to your second screen and fill it from top to bottom with icons and so on and so forth. Right. And that is sort of the, correct me if I'm wrong, but like, that's more or less the, the social norm of, of how you configure your iPhone. And then at that, WWC, or, or go ahead, Gazy. I was going to say that's the norm, although I will use myself as an example of odd way of an odd way that people use their iPhone. For whatever reason, and I read this somewhere, and I've been trying to figure out where I read this, but I copied from someone on the internet that on their first home screen, <clears> and <throat> only their first home screen, this was it me. one of you? It was me. Was it you? Yeah. Okay. So on on Marco's first home screen, he leaves the row above the dock blank. And I don't know why that rang true with me, but I was like, you know what? That's a really good idea. So on my first and only first home screen, I have the bottom row blank but on every other screen of which there are generally a total of three um i i use up every every single space yeah and that's that's the thing i started seeing people intentionally leaving blank rows on uh, not on the last page and, and like even having it on the first page and my question i guess for both of you since you're doing this is why why do you have a blank row above your dock on the first page well, I have a I have another whole complexity of my system also, but um, which iOS seven makes awesome actually. But the the main reason why I have always done that was that like the very first iPhone, like with version one point before apps, had uh, I believe one icon in the bottom row or none. I'll have to look this up, but um, so it was just kind of always what I was used to. Um, it provides like a nice like kind of neutral swipe area to swipe between the two screens where you can swipe anywhere. You can, but like it's like it's like a reliable area. Like you know you can swipe there and not accidentally launch something. You will um, never accidentally launch something by swiping. It will not happen. I bet it has happened. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so there's there was that kind of legacy reason. I also think it looks better. It looks a lot less crowded, and. Um, I also the bottom row is always like where my app in progress, which is usually Instapaper, uh, would go. And so, because it, at first, like in the early versions of the SDK, I think every time you installed the app on the phone, it would move it to like the default next app location or something like that, which was always right there, something like that. Anyway, there was some reason with development why I would always have Instapaper and back when it existed, Instapaper free 
in that bottom row by themselves. So then the, like, the second half of it was clear. The other thing I do that's weird um, that I recommend to anybody who, who uh, wants to try this, I used to, you know, back when the App Store first came out, I would have all these different pages of apps, and it just sucked. Um, once folders came out, I decided to do a different system, which uh, I don't – generally, I don't like folders. I, I think they're very clumsy to, to uh, enter and leave. And actually, on iOS 7, I like them even less because they hold less uh, per screen. You, you at least do have paged folders now, so folders have way more total capacity. But it moved from showing – what was it before? 12? It would show three rows or four rows. Uh, let me look. I think you're right. Hold so on. in iOS 6, I believe it showed you 12 or 16 icons in a folder. And it is 12. And uh, oh, you, you but you have the short phone though. Oh, uh, the big why do you fat heavy one like that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, shut you, up. You, you get guys. sixteen on, on the five. Right. Okay. So is that true? Is that really yeah, you, true? Yeah, you get an extra row. God, you're so spoiled. Isn't that great? <laughs> but uh, on on iOS seven, let me double check here, um, just to make sure I'm, I get this right. I believe you only get nine. Um, this is just this is not yeah, against the NDA, of course. Yes, on iOS seven, you only get edge. nine per per folder screen, and you can have multiple screens, as I said, but. It, it ends up that like you know getting into the folder is already an extra tap, and so to have to like page through a folder only seeing nine at a time is kind of clumsy. Um, and you have no neutral swipe area inside folders. What do you do? That's a great question. I don't know. <laughs> I, I just launch apps accidentally all the time. But what I do is my very first page, um, I keep configured mostly the way the original iPhone always was configured uh, with everything in roughly the same spots. Uh, if I have like a really awesome preferred replacement app i'll put it in the same spot that the apple app used to go so like for example i use solver instead of calculator and so solver is the second row rightmost spot for me because that's where the calculator was i believe in the original iphone anyway on, and so the, on the first page there's no folders on the second page that's where all the folders go and it can have it can have individual icons also but the second page is where all folders go and then i only have those two pages which is really honestly great i love having switched to a two two page only standard because you always know like you always know where you are you're either on your on your first page or you're not it's very 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 easy and all the things that you that you want to like bury for occasional use can go in one of those folders in the second page and with iOS 7 now now that folders can hold so much more in total you can at least say like you know, I used to have like games, new games, new games to test, like all like three different folders for games because they wouldn't all fit in one. And now I just have one. And I, you know, I have a folder called like Rare and Utility, and you know, now I just have like Rare. You know, so there's anyway. I I highly recommend doing a two screen only setup and using as many folders as you need to on the second screen to to do that. Uh, it really is awesome. And on the iPad, I even just do a one page setup, which is even better. Just there's not enough room in the iPhone to do it. Oh, you don't have to swipe anywhere. Exactly. <laughs> and now, now they – thank God they moved Spotlight. I, I love that change in iOS 7. They moved Spotlight so that you have to pull it down from the top. It's no longer like a springboard page to the far left. So I think one of the stupidest things in, in old iOS was when you were on the home screen, if you tap the home button, that would be a shortcut to go over to the Spotlight screen. And that – so many times I accidentally did that, and I've seen other people do it even more. In fact, John, you can probably tell me from your regular people experience, how many times do they accidentally go to Spotlight by hitting the home button too many times? I see that a lot, but I also think it's kind of like people hit the home button when they want to go like back to the beginning and they understand that concept. And if they're already at the beginning and they hit it again, it probably means that they want to go back backer to the more beginninger. And basically, like they can't find what they're looking for. They're like, oh, no, just bring me back to like the beginning beginning. And throwing the search field in their face is like, oh, all right, well, I guess I can type here because I kind of know what the name of the thing is that I'm looking for. So it's kind of like, look, this is the last resort. You you press this button because obviously you're not finding what you think you're supposed to be finding, but we've already brought you to the place that this button press takes you. So by pressing it again, you're saying, no, I'm still not satisfied. Here's the last resort. Go to search. I, but, you know, for me personally, it's just frustrating when I accidentally hit it because I don't notice I'm on the, the first screen or something. But for other people, I have to wonder if it's not... Uh, an okay thing and i kind of like the fact that it was to the left of the home screen i especially like the uh what they did with the uh, little icons at the bottom maybe this is too subtle for most people but they, the little dot icons right and when you're on the first page there is one more dot to your left but it's not a dot it's a tiny tiny magnifying glass which is adorable so i kind of like <laughs> go look at your ios 6 device now. no, especially I, on no you're right and and that that was a nice touch but 
I just I have personally and I've witnessed so many accidentally invocations of Spotlight by that double home button tap thing that I have to imagine that's not worth it. And yeah, so I'm, for, I'm very for, glad they got rid of that in seven. For experienced users, yeah, so it's I not, hear not, not, it's not a good experience. Yeah. Uh, so for what I saw for people using the iPhones was not just leaving a row blank, but wiping out every single icon except for one row of four on the top. And what I even saw on one person's phone was one row of four on the top on the first home screen page, all folders. What? And everything else basically deleted and wiped out. And and But some people had like multiple pages where you go to the next page, one row of four at the top. Maybe not all folders, maybe all folders. And, you know, only a couple pages, maybe three or four pages, but only one row of icons at the top. And, of course, the dock on the bottom because I don't know if they knew how to get things out of there or whatever. And... You know, before I spoke to these people, I just saw their devices or saw them using them or whatever. I'm like, what? What's going on there? Why? Why? Why would you ever do that? It doesn't make any sense. Like, unless they unless they're following the Marco philosophy, I just need a massive safe region to swipe. But that wasn't it because these people weren't <laughs> weren't looking for a safe. So, after speaking to them, the reason they're doing this, can you guys guess before I reveal it? Do they think it uh, saves battery life or otherwise it's no, performance no. related? Too sophisticated. Casey, nothing. I don't even have the fan. Oh, because they want to make sure they have the space for the expanded folder. No, that's a good one though. That's close. Yeah, it's because they put a picture on their wallpaper and they want to see the picture of their kids or family or whatever. And the picture is like the top part of the picture is just background, like trees or whatever. uh, But the faces are in the bottom part. And people with pictures, people had pictures that were purposely like biased to the lower part so the people's faces were lower down so they could get two rows of icons because they want to see they want to see the people's pictures that makes and that is something that like you know adding what did they add it in ios four or five they added the ability to have you know wallpapers instead of just a a black background that you know that's an unforeseen side effect of giving people the ability to put a picture in the background is that they're going to want to see it and they're going to clear out because they don't want some icons sitting on top of their kid's head they're just going to move those things out of the way and what they're left with is a screen with nothing on it, and the the like four folders at the top is like well, when you only have one row of icons, you want you still want some minimum amount of stuff to be on page one, so then just shove it all into folders. It's incredibly inefficient. It makes no sense to me, but this is how they choose to use their phones, and it just goes to show that you know features uh, have unforeseen side effects, and the way you think people will use your device is very different from the way they'll use it in real life because they have t- very different concerns. So I was, I was fascinated to see this common pattern across all the people. And, and the other thing of this, I could, could have guessed is that the people who delete everything off the phone, they could possibly delete because they don't know what it is. Like this is, this is why it's actually good that you can't delete like the phone app and stuff, because if you could, they would, and then wonder why they can't send <laughs> phone. You know what I mean? We're all annoyed that you can't delete calculator and stuff like that. And maybe it would be okay to let those go. But people are just like, Nope, I know how to use four things in this phone. I want to get everything else out of there. So their solution is just to move them off to the other screen. And that I would have predicted and have seen before. Don't tell them about the parental controls. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's too deep. <laughs> I don't know if they knew what the settings <laughs> app was. They deleted settings. Yeah. And like, you know, and these are the same people. Like, uh, One person really was annoyed about the weather channel on their new television uh, service. And I said, well, you have an iPhone. There's eight gazillion weather apps. Find one that you like. But there's you'll no have good ones. The, you'll have the weather... <laughs> You'll have oh, the weather forecast. The no, you're right. <laughs> You'll have the weather forecast right there. Like even you know, something like Dark Sky or whatever saying like if, you, if your whole obsession is when it's going to rain, there's apps with like real-time radar. Like we have the technology that's better than, you know, watching the weather channel and waiting through commercials and weather reports for areas where you don't live or whatever, or having to go into the TV room, turn on the TV. And I said, no, I prefer to see it on TV. I want someone talking to me. Even though it involves watching commercials and watching weather for, for towns that are not your town and like that's that's crazy to me, but you know, old habits die hard, I guess. I will say, Dark Sky is still one of those things that can blow the mind of any normal person. Yeah, yeah no, I tried, I tried to show up, but it's not, it's like not impressive. I want, I want a weather person on TV telling me the weather. <laughs> I want that human touch. Anyway, <laughs> all right. Do you want to talk about this Dropbox thing? Well, we do. Is John done? Is that yeah? I mean, that, that's. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll think of more later. But the two the two big ones were, uh, yeah, the the home screen, so you can see the picture and getting all the applications of the home screen, and then the the total totally being unimpressed by applications that not just the weather, but any kind of applications like things that we all know that you can do with your phone. That you know, you know, you can do X Y Z with your phone. Like, nah, that doesn't seem appealing. 
Now, did you see a lot of people force quitting apps for no good reason? No. Because I still see that constantly. None of these people know how to do that. Well, the really scary part is in 7, I don't know how much this was public. I'll I'll tread lightly. Um, In iOS 7, there's actually a really good reason to remove apps from the multitasking switcher. No, they have it in the movies, yeah, because you want to you you want to get it get them out of there so they're not in your way, so you don't you know. No, that's not it. Them. There's well, that's I mean maybe that's part of it for some people, but in seven, I know what you're the thinking. The new uh, backgrounding stuff. Uh, I don't I don't know if this is public or not. Well, let's see if anybody cares. The new backgrounding stuff in seven, um, where your app can be woken up periodically in the background. If your app has been removed from the switcher, it does not do that, so you can't get background updates which is a change since iOS 6, because with 6, even like like the newsstand content available things would go through no matter what. Um, but in 7, if your app's been removed from the switcher, you don't get any background wake-up types of any... Uh, you know, you can, you can still get push notifications that alert the user, but your app will not run in the background at all if you've been removed. So there actually is a, a pretty substantial reason to to manage or not manage the things in that switcher now. So come to think of it, that means that all these ill-informed people who are constantly clearing out what is now their multitasking tray are actually kind of shooting themselves in the foot because now all of their apps that are not running in the background won't get up, well, running in the background, so to speak, aren't getting updates and they're actually demonstrably, they were already demonstrably uh, penalizing their own experience, but now it's even worse. There's even more reason not to do that. Or to do all. This is all just a sliver of, you know, because like it's it's there's the, there's the people who are tech nerds who know all the details. Then there is the aspirational tech nerds who know enough to force quit. And then there's the vast, vast majority of people who have no idea about holding down your finger to get the little red thing and who will continue to have no idea about swiping up to get rid of those icons. Because it's not there's nothing there that indicates that that's possible, just like there's nothing in there that indicates that you can press and hold on the multitasking switcher. And I think I have to think that the vast majority of people will never use either one of those features and the phone will just manage it for them. So it's just this fringe of the people who know enough to be dangerous that are – Right, know, the power users. Power users are like the most dangerous users to support or like for, for anybody, for IT departments, for developers, for themselves. They're just always like the worst type user to support because power users, um, they know enough to cause trouble and, or, or to cause headaches for themselves or others, but usually not enough to really fix things if they break them or, or uh, have a really great environment and, and – they're usually the ones that are most susceptible to superstition and and myths and crazy stuff like that. When I heard a lot of reports that geniuses, quote unquote geniuses, were telling people to force quit everything under the sun because that makes your iPhone run faster, which is just patently wrong. Even in iOS 6, that's just wrong. Right. Well, and again, geniuses, many of them are this type of person, the power user who like, you know, they know enough to have that job. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they know the intricate details of how iOS works and why right. why that's a bad idea or why that does or doesn't do something. And uh, I mean, almost almost any like IT person that you're that you're likely to run into in any kind of you know work IT department or anything like that, almost all of them are this type of re- uh, this type of user. There's there's some really good ones that that know a lot more, um, but most of the people you'll run into in this kind of context are like the knows not to be dangerous power user. And that's one of the reasons why all these crazy myths like defragging, uh, you know, long after that was – long after that mattered, all these crazy myths get propagated and live on um, because it's all these power users saying, you know, oh, well, it, you need to do this and this and this every day to f- keep your phone clean or whatever. And then – and, you know, nothing bad ever happens if you do that, so you just keep propagating it. You know, your platform has arrived when you get one of those because the Mac <laughs> had a had a, a long sequence of them. I think the probably the first one I can think of was like rebuilding the desktop, but you had zapping the PRAM, you had all those things and then like the Mac OS ten got repairing permissions, uh and then iOS, I guess the first one is the first one that iOS got was the uh, force quitting apps. That's the only one I know of. I believe so. Cause that yeah. that was like one of the first things you could do as kind of like an amateur system administrator to, for your phone. It was like, like there's not much else you can do. <laughs> there is no iOS defect. Although there are, you know, there have been like crazy scam apps in the app store that are like maximize your battery life and st- like stuff like that. And I, I always wonder how they get approved because, you know, then you read the description and you find out like, oh, well, it's actually just like it's a joke app officially or it's educational only or it just has like list of tips and tricks that you're supposed to do. 
but there's a lot of apps, even like if you look in the top lists, there's a lot of apps that are selling really well that are basically scams preying on this kind of mythology of like, oh, that an app can compress your memory on iOS or can speed your phone up or save your battery life. Yeah, and uh, a, somebody in the chat, I shouldn't per, uh, share this person's name just to be safe. Again, from working in the Apple store or at the Apple store, the company would send out numerous memos reminding us that force quitting everything under the sun was wrong. But tons of my colleagues would spread that lie and practice it themselves, which is kind of sad. But that's that's the nature of superstition. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you, if you can't be convinced by a presentation of evidence, the whole point of superstition. Right. And it, and it's, you know, those <laughs> things that spread so easily are the things that like, well, if you do them, nothing bad really happens. And you can't really tell if anything yeah. good happens because it's too, too small of a difference if it, like, quote, works. You don't need the feather. You just need to believe. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think that's a Dumbo reference. I haven't seen the movie in years. I don't know. Yeah, neither have I. So this episode is also sponsored by another return sponsor. It's Audible. Audible is the leading provider of downloadable audiobooks with over 100,000 titles and virtually every genre. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. You can listen to audiobooks anytime, anywhere. iPhones, iPads, computers, Kindles, even iPods. They're offering ATP listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash ATP to take advantage of this special offer. So once again, it's audiblepodcast.com slash ATP to get free audiobook with a 30-day free trial. Guys, do you have any audiobooks to recommend? You know, I I haven't looked, to be honest, to confirm that this is on Audible, but I bet you it is. Um, I was asked recently what my favorite movie is, and if you bear with me for a second, my favorite movie, if I had to pick just one, is probably The Hunt for Red October, and you, you can judge me on that, and I, I won't be offended. But it's actually based on a Tom Clancy book, also, curiously enough, called The Hunt for October. And the book, as with almost every book that's ever been written that was eventually turned into a movie, is actually considerably better than the movie. So I would recommend The Hunt for October if you're into political thrillers based in the early to mid-1980s when we still hated Russia and Russia still hated us. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks a lot to Audible for sponsoring the show. Remember, go to audiblepodcast.com slash ATP. Thanks a lot. You're not even going to ask me if I have a pick? Do you have a pick? Ah, well, maybe we should save it for the next Audible sponsorship. All right, save it. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Be that guy. (laughs) All right, so moving along. Is there anything much to talk about with this Dropbox thing? Actually, I I don't know if you're being sarcastic or not, but I thought there was. You know, I'm so tired of platforms. Really? I mean, do we really need another platform? Well, I mean, it's an existing platform, though. It's in a, Well, as Steve Jobs would say, it's not a platform, it's a feature. But anyway, Dropbox <laughs> exists and is popular. And the reason we are interested in their data store, at least I'm interested in the data store, right, is because it's from Dropbox. Uh, people already have Dropbox accounts. Many people already pay for Dropbox. Many iOS applications already integrate with Dropbox using an existing API for file storage. So that's an advantage that many, many other things that are supposedly going to store your crap do not have right even you know even google mighty google come out with an api but it's like well all right but how, and how many applications are already integrated with google data storage like it's a, it's a bigger hurdle to overcome whereas dropbox are like you're already there your apps are already talking to it this is basically the equivalent of uh instead of just documents in the cloud document icloud storage it's like their equivalents kind of sort of not really of uh, core data sync where you're I hope not well you know what I mean like you're not you're not just storing you're not just storing files you're storing something that's not just a, a linear stream of bytes in a single named entity right that's basically where the similarity ends because core data is this whole other sort of you know persistent object store thing and this is much simpler this is you know basically schemaless fields with uh, in, in basically tables so you have a table and has records the records have an id they have name value pairs in them and you can do one small level of nesting underneath that uh and that's it i, I look at these things because i think it's interesting to see how what kind of api are they going to offer like they're definitely not going the core data route where they say just use your objects in memory and we'll magically synchronize them and with the persistence across all these applications and you can just the rest of your application just behaves as if it's using objects in memory and we make everything work uh it's not quite doing you can just you know sort of speak to a database over a wire and we'll do updates where it's like a server resident database it's kind of in between they want you to be able to store records in this thing 
and get notified when there are changes to the re these records and uh, but they don't want you to have to implement your own conflict resolution this is where the rubber meets the road it's like what if i do two different things on two different devices they're both offline they come back online and synchronize the changes what do i do to sort these things out and looking at their documentation briefly it seems like your choices are minimal all the conflict resolution seems to be automatic and your choices are like biggest value wins smallest value wins sum of value wins and that's about it and it's like well that doesn't help me if i'm trying to synchronize an address book. None of those policies seem like they would be helpful. Uh, uh, local wins versus remote wins. Like there didn't even seem to be any date stamping type things in there where you could tell which one happened at a different time and synchronize based on that and resolve conflicts based on that. So I'm not sure what the target audience for this thing is, but like any kind of service, the real proof is going to be, is it reliable? Is it fast? And is it easy to program for in a way that doesn't block my application when, when uh, you know, the changes don't come in and, in that respect, it looks like it has some advantages over uh, iCloud Core Data the way it existed in that you don't you don't need to be online. Your changes can take effect locally, and remote changes can come in whenever they want. So in theory, you shouldn't be blocking as long as you can write to your local disk and as long as you, so you can read from your local disk. So that's good. Yeah, there were I, – I also looked at the API and the documentation, and there were a couple of things that, that piqued my interest – um, firstly, and this is outside of the documentation, quite obviously Dropbox is cross-platform. And let's suppose for the sake of argument that uh, even core data in iCloud worked flawlessly, which is a pretty funny thought just to begin with. Well, it's still Apple-centric. And even though I, I speak for all three of us in saying we're all in on Apple platforms, not everyone is like that. We talked about that earlier in this very episode. And so Dropbox is cross-platform, which is really nice. So if I was psychotic enough to want to write not only an iOS app but also an Android app, I could presumably use this Dropbox data store API in order to get data between them. Additionally, like you mentioned, John, it's not straight SQL. And while core data, you'll get you know, smacked, uh, smacked on the wrist if you call it a database, it isn't a database. Just like you said, it's a, per, it's a object persistence or object graph persistence mechanism. Um, in the, it, generally speaking, behind the scenes, it's SQLite or SQLite or whatever crap it's supposed to be pronounced as. Whereas this, like you said, John, is, is a little more flexible than that, which is nice. Obviously, there's caveats to that, and that could be bad, but generally speaking, it's nice. But the other thing that was really interesting is they have a data store web inspector. And I glanced at it very, very quickly, and it appears that even regular people, not even necessarily developers, can go in and inspect the data stores associated with their Dropbox account. And I think that's both very good and arguably maybe not so good because it allows developers to go in and see exactly what tables and records and things are stored in their own Dropbox. But that also gives some amount of visibility for a user. Now, it is read-only through, through this web interface, but it's still more visibility than you may want. Now, to argue with myself briefly, maybe that's a good thing, after all, in the sense that if somebody's storing a bunch of data that I don't want them to store, I could go see that and then remove that app. But I don't know, it just freaks me out for the idea of users seeing exactly how I'm persisting data. Well, that's good yeah. because then you could shame people who start plain text passwords and stuff, you know, because like, <laughs> regular true. users exactly can go and see it. And so they could see, hey, you're storing my whole address book or, hey, there's my plain text right. password and that's for my whatever, point. whatever service. And no, but like, it's interesting. The reason I put that link in, in the uh, show notes is that it's interesting that they launch with that. Like, of course, of course, it's going to be a web interface to see what's on the server well, side. How can, you, how can you develop an application if you don't have visibility into what we're doing in the data store? <laughs> and, their, and their data store is so much simpler. Like, it is, it is just very simple and primitive compared to the amazing thing that Core Data is supposed to be doing for you. Like, it's up to you to figure it out. No schema, name, value, pairs, lists. You know, you're going to get a notification that something changed will give you a list of record ideas. You figure it out. I don't know, whatever. Like, it's really primitive. Uh, and... Primitive things are kind of annoying to, you know, you have to write all your own logic to deal with the, these, uh, you know, the updates and stuff. But it's easy for developers to understand. And time and again, that's proved to be much more important than the amazing framework, especially if it doesn't work right. The amazing framework does awesome things to you versus the simple one that doesn't do as much for you. But what it does do is easily understandable by any developer. And that gives even like a, a novice or a mediocre developer a fighting chance of using your API to do useful work. Because maybe they use it inefficiently and maybe they have to write a ton of code themselves. But... 
conceptually the way it works is like you know it, it, it's simple enough that they can wrap their head around it so they never get themselves into a situation where they have no idea what's going on they just perhaps make uh inefficient code so this uh, you know again we'll have to look at their performance there and uh and how reliable their services and stuff like that but I think they have a big leg up on everyone else simply because we already all have Dropbox accounts. Uh, and, and I think like the first five megabytes per application that you use does not count towards your Dropbox quota. So if you just want to use this to store like preferences or small amounts of state information, or, you know, five megabytes is actually a lot, you know, as long as you're not using it as your main data storage, that doesn't count towards your Dropbox quota. And of course, once you go over that, then you just start using the person's Dropbox quota, which is great for Dropbox because then eventually if you're a free user, you hit your limit because you use some application then you end up being a paid customer and, it's all a virtuous cycle. So uh, I'm cautiously optimistic about this. Now, what are the implications for Apple? Because one could argue that this is iCloud, but or core data iCloud, but not done by Apple and hopefully actually functional. So does this light a fire under Apple's keister and make them make core data and iCloud actually work? Or do you think they don't care? Oh, they don't care. I mean... Yeah. There are people there who do care, obviously. You know, the people who are on that team obviously do care quite a bit and are working their butts off, I assume. However, you can simply look at what Apple does. Look at the results. You can tell that iCloud is really seen as an accessory in the company, and especially the iCloud uh, developer APIs, the sync APIs and stuff, that Apple themselves barely uses uh, for their own apps. Uh, you can look at that stuff, and you can very much see this is like – this is not – a very high priority for the company. And again, you know, so I'm sure it's a very high priority for the people working on it, but you can tell that it's not getting the resources it needs. It's not getting the priority it needs um, because look at the last year, not much has really changed. Well, and, this was in the WWC keynote, though. Didn't they have a section of the keynote that we can actually talk about where they said where they said what their policy about iCloud core data was going forward? That was not in the keynote? Uh, Maybe it was in the State of the Union. I don't remember. Well, they, they mentioned it in the State of the Union. Um, but which we can't talk about. But I, I believe yeah, it's yeah. safe to say we, that they basically said, like, give us another shot uh, in, in, as, in as many words. But I, I just don't see it. I mean, we, we see this with almost all of Apple's online services, uh, especially the ones that Apple themselves doesn't really rely on very much. Um, we see that they just don't really put that much effort into them. Well, you know, e even ones that are ostensibly flagship features like messages like that's that's apple's application it's an important apple application it obviously got attention because it was massively redesigned yet it still doesn't perform its basic functions in a reliable manner so even when apple is totally using like not that i'm saying that it uses icloud core data i don't know what it uses but the point is it's it uses an online service that apple implements and it is a flagship application and it, is, it still doesn't work <laughs> right so that's you know them using it is not a guarantee that their online services work correctly but it, it certainly helps right but it just it just seems like you know, Apple still has a lot of that tunnel vision that they are infamous for, where something gets a whole lot of attention, but then everything outside of the the immediately obvious first interesting thing that they're working on uh, gets pretty neglected for a while. And you know, it, it's it's still a sign of of Apple being a smaller company than their than their success and their money and their their sales and their presence would indicate, you know, they, they still are a very small company with very small teams relative to all the stuff they do. And so how they prioritize their resources, it still is very much a, uh, a, a, a zero sum game with them. Like they, they don't just add a brand new team to address brand new things they're doing. They like move people around and deprioritize other things to prioritize certain things like they they don't just like buy more people out of nowhere and and they have this giant department all of a sudden and uh you know we've talked in the past about how google is so good at just applying way more brute force engineering to problems than apple usually does especially in the services area and i just don't see any evidence of apple changing that anytime soon so anything like this that is basically a major online service that's really tricky to get right and has lots of substantial um, design tricks, technical challenges, and and service challenges and big data challenges. I don't see Apple ever doing well. I'll say Apple's making their life harder here by uh, uh, not Google. Dropbox has chosen to make a simpler API. Like it, it does less stuff for you. It is 
just simpler, right? Much simpler than iCloud Cordana, far, far simpler, right? So that gives them a fighting chance of getting it to work correctly, having a small API that developers can pick up. And that's like a philosophical difference between the team that's responsible for doing these kind of services for Apple philosophically. I mean, it's part of it's philosophical and part of it's like, look, they already had core data. People already have core data applications. What are you going to say to those people? Hey, we want your applications to work with iCloud, but core data doesn't work with iCloud. So rewrite your thing to use something more like the Dropbox Sync API. Like that would have been a tough sell back when, you know, iCloud core data was introduced, which is why everyone's so excited. Oh, but I have a, a core data application and they tell me we'll work with iCloud. Yeah, I don't have to rewrite it because think of if you told them, okay, well, you just have to throw out core data and use this new API that is totally unlike core data, much simpler. You have to do a lot more coding to get it to work. Uh, but trust us, that's that's how online will work. And that's like kind of like online companies know your APIs have to be small, simple, and semantically you know easy to understand uh, because that's that's the way to do it. You If you try to make something big and complicated, your API is going to be big and complicated on, on the client side, and the server is going to be really hard to implement in an efficient manner and scale and all those other things. So don't do that. But Apple is so far sticking to their guns and saying we're you know they do have key value store and like they could enhance key value store over the course of a year to basically make it match this dropbox api and remove all their storage limits because key value store is really just for tiny data uh and they would have the equivalent of this and by all accounts key value store does work better because it's simpler it does it has to do less stuff right but they are saying no we want to we want to make core data work magically over the internet and it's a big complicated api with lots of corner cases both on the client and the server and if anything goes wrong, bad things happen, and we need more debugging tools, and it's a really hard problem. And the size of the team that's doing the Dropbox data API is probably like one-tenth of the people who are trying to do the core data thing, and yet they'll probably be more successful because they chose to do something simpler. You know, the, the only thing that I wonder, and I didn't see specifically noted in the API documentation, is what about sharing? So I keep coming back to my example of, sharing a grocery list with my wife. And it seems like the this Dropbox uh, data store API would be perfect for it, except that I didn't see any mention of sharing, but maybe I missed it. John, did you happen to notice anything? Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any sharing. I think it's kind of like it's just a data store for your application. Right. It's shared from that user on multiple devices, but not right, like right, you, right. There's, no, there's no like server. So, you know, well, there is I mean, one important part, them. though. There is a JavaScript API as well. And I I haven't verified this yet but i would assume that you could use that like maybe from node or, or the other server side uh, javascript uh, interpreters so you could probably uh run this server side with job with their javascript api well yeah but then you still need to like authenticate as you to get exactly. access to your data store so if i authenticate as me i'm not going to see any cases data stores i guess you could copy yeah, it out into some other service then right and then like, provide, like a if, clearing if you ran your own web service that that used this uh, I would imagine you could you could whip that up. You know, you could just have have a few pages that that do that. You know, the, the bounce through authentication for you, and and you authenticate your own people. To who's who's going to see what? Although, if you're going to go through all that, you might as well just have your own sync service on your server. Yeah, I mean that that's what it boils down to. Is like if, you, it, but see, since they have sharing for their file API, I mean this is this is like their version one, right? So maybe the next version they add, you know, obviously they know about sharing. They they have some means for you to take the same file and share it amongst many people and revoke sharing and and all that other stuff. It seems like that would have to come for these data stores because they have it chunked out into like you have a data store. Data store have tables. Tables have records. They could do the sharing at probably the the data store or table level and it wouldn't be crazy but maybe not for version one right yeah i doubt it but all in all i i, I give this two thumbs up i think this is definitely well a uh, tentative two thumbs up i think this is definitely a good start if it actually works i think it's a very simple yet at the same time like you were saying john kind of robust uh way of syncing data that's a very low cost of entry, both financially and in terms of effort. And so I think this is really cool. And although I'm not sure I disagree with you guys in that it, Apple won't care about this, it also makes me wonder, especially if adoption is really high. Marco I wonder said if that, that, not me. Uh, oh, fair enough. <laughs> I, uh, well, but I, I hope in, and I wonder that if adoption of this Dropbox Data Store API is really high, if Apple will start to pay attention and really do something about iCloud and, and, and iCloud and core data. I should also say that I I know that there was a session or two about iCloud and Core Data at WWDC, but I've not yet watched them, so I don't know 
if that was just Apple groveling. I don't know if perhaps in iOS 7 there's going to be massive improvements. I truly honestly don't know. But those of you who do have a developer account should go check it out, and I should take my own advice in that issue. I've seen those sessions, and there is news to be had there. Uh, Interesting. One, one okay. thing, one thing you didn't, uh, we didn't mention to tie it back to like, topics from last week's show is: what if a newsreader decided to use uh, Dropbox Data Store as its sync service? Obviously, you can't use it to get your feeds for you and give you your content, but just keeping track of which things you read and haven't read seems like a fairly ideal. You know, so you don't want to make someone sign up for your own service. You want them to use the account that they already have that they pay for. You don't have to run the servers. You just have to store some state information about last read state and what articles have marked read and favorited or whatever random metadata you want to keep. Like it's basically, you know, you make up the data store that you want. You still might need a service to fetch all your feeds and do all that other stuff. But that this other part of it for synchronizing which things are read and uh, even just having the applications themselves fetch the feeds. I know that's torturous, but in the old days, that's what things used to do. And hell, that's how I'm using that newswire now. Uh, it's possible. This is this could be a piece of people's, uh, you know, reading API. In the well, future. and even no. and even more than that, what if you mix that with this new backgrounding stuff, where it could be a nice combination? I agree with what I think you're about to say, Marco. In that, I don't know if that's really sustainable, but it's a very interesting approach. Well, my my big thing with it is that. If you're going to run, if you're going to be having like feed syncing and stuff like that, there's a lot of advantages to running your own service for to do that. There's there's not only things you can do in the background when the app isn't running, um, but you can also one of the biggest things with feeds in particular is parsing them and and you're running into people's weird malformed feeds. Like you know if you can if you can adjust your parsers on the server side immediately and have that apply to everything to, for everyone immediately instead of having to like bundle them into an app update and ship the app update or have some kind of weird system where you have like server side definitions of what the app will interpret and then you have to add new things it can do to accommodate some crazy new feed condition. Um, there, there certainly are a lot of reasons with readers in particular to, uh, to still have a service. Plus now we have like 15,000 reader services. Well, that's what I was thinking of is that say you make a reader, right? And you want to let people pick from the umpteen other reader services that are going to do the feed parsing for you and stuff like that, right? But you also want to add value in your application and you and you also want, say you have awesome ideas for features, but three out of the four feed things that you support for your you know aggregation and everything don't support those features. You need some layer on top of that to add your own, you know, enhancements. So like maybe one of them, you know, Three out of the four don't support, like, favoriting or something like that. Well, you could store information about your favorites. Where? Do you want to run a whole service that? Yeah, you could. But if it's simple enough, you could just use Dropbox as your back end. You know, Dropbox and iCloud are two possible options for, like, key value storage or whatever, depending on how much data you have, to enhance the, the back end features. Because otherwise, you're forced to do the lowest common denominator of all your services. So if one of them doesn't support, like, folders or something, you're like, well, I guess I can't support folders because where would I keep track of my folders? Well, I can keep track of them locally, but then it doesn't synchronize, or it just synchronizes on iOS if I use iCloud, but if I want to have a web version, blah, 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 well, there's the Dropbox data store. That's what I'm thinking, like, as an, as an enhancement layer so that your application can be better than the umpteen services that it supports. Maybe, but then it also has the problem, you know, I, I wrote about this with, with uh, NetNewsWire in particular. Um, there's the problem then of, like, you only get that benefit if you use that application on all your devices that, that you browse feeds from. And so yeah, uh, if you only get, but, like, if, if NetNewsWire adds features that only work in NetNewsWire, then you have to use NetNewsWire on Mac and iPhone and iPad if you, if you read feeds in all those places to get those benefits. But if you use Feedbin as your back end, then you can use any iOS reader that supports Feedbin. And yeah, you won't have those fancy features, but maybe you like a different reader better on the other platforms. And presumably you like it better, you know, for whatever reasons. But you're not tied. You're not like, you know, we're saying in that news article, you're not actually tied to use the same reader everywhere because you're, the, the basics, the lowest common denominator syncs everywhere because everyone then uses Feedly or Feedbin or whatever your, your third-party services think the basics are. But on particular platforms, you have enhancements. And if they do a good enough job with their clients, maybe you'll want to use those enhancements on other platforms. Like, you know, like basically you're saying, oh, okay, if I want to use a different readers on different platforms, that means that either the reader isn't available for all the platforms I want, or maybe I have different feature desires from one platform to the other. But well, if you have different feature desires, then you don't care that those enhancements that you use on your Mac don't work elsewhere. But if you do care about these awesome features in the Mac client, what you'll want to use is the iOS version of that same client. So, you know, n nothing is, nothing is going to give you, you know, everything you want which is 
Don't give me lowest common denominator features. Give me my choice of readers on every single platform and synchronize everything between them. Like that's never going to happen because it's just not. It's like it's it's not a solvable problem. So you have to pick and choose. And I think this this type of solution where you use a common backend for lowest common denominator functionality and then individual applications are free to enhance in the front end using some other service. Uh, that's that's pretty close to to ideal, you know. Yeah, I guess that and it causes weird issues. In other ways, though, like for instance, let's say, let's say Black Pixel ships Net Newswire and it uses, uh, you know, Feedbin or Feed Wrangler or any of these, any of these other services, um, it, or it can use them, and then it it does what you're saying, where it uses some other backend, whether it's their own or Dropbox or whatever, to add bigger things to it, and then let's say Feedbin and Feed Wrangler add to their own services that capability, and then other clients add it. Like, does Net Newswire then adopt that? Because then they're removing a competitive advantage they have over other feed readers by doing that. Like it, well, it's, I, it, it'll get, cause weird situations like that if people really do this. Once we get real numbers, though, they'll be like, "Look, okay, I added support for these five backends, but in reality, ninety percent of my users use these two backends. So right away, I can eliminate those other backends from having to support them because it's kind of a pain to support lots of different backends. And of the two remaining features, actually, some of the stuff I was implementing myself is available in both of them. I think all developers would be happy to say, "Oh, great! Well, the two remaining ones that I support have this feature, so I can shift it off." onto them but there's always that tension between how much of the value of my application is reliant on the value of a third-party service that i don't control uh and it's great that you can have different clients in the same third-party service but you are just you know in some respects at the at the mercy of that third-party service like if they take away a feature that you are relying on so it's good to have some place to you know either if they take away a feature you can shift it to your back end and if they add a feature you can take it out of your back end if it is now part of the new lowest common denominator that you decided to support. This is just an uncomfortable period now because people are just supporting as much as they possibly can and they don't know how things are going to shake out. But I have to think there's going to be, instead of seven of them, there's going to be like two or three popular ones left standing after a year, right? Well, I think we're actually already seeing that shakeout happening now. I mean, I, I published my numbers earlier today from what, from what I could get. Uh, it seems like Feedly is by far the most popular alternative, mostly because it's free. And uh, I believe it's one of the only ones that's free. Newsblur is second. I, I think Newsblur is free, but then has premium features that you can optionally buy. Um, and, but and Newsblur has been around forever. It, it's been around way longer. I believe it was four years. Um, it's been around way longer than th- these other services have. Um, and then Feed Wrangler and Feedbin are basically neck and neck. They're t- they're very similar in that they're both paid services run by very small teams. I believe they're both run by single people, and uh, or Feedbin might have two. Uh, anyway, um, very small teams, and, uh, and and then there's pretty much after that there's a pretty big drop off. Like besides that handful, like there's literally my list is. Feedly, Newsblur, Net Newswire clients not even using a service, Feed Wrangler and Feedbin, and then everything else is is like less than half of those, and it drops down, it drops off pretty quickly. And so I think we're already seeing that very few services are are showing up. Now that being said, I don't yet have numbers for Dig Reader or AOL, and those are those are pretty. I, I've heard a lot of people mentioning those. I don't know how big they are, um, but we will see. There's probably room for new entrants in this next year as well. Oh, sure, because like, these are people all... People who, have, who haven't come... Out. These are the guys who scrambled to get something ready because right. the new Google Reader was going away. And, and in general, they tend to be small people. But if there's some bigger, slower-moving entity entering this field, who knows when they could land something that does this. I mean, right. Amazon could do it for all we know. They do crazy things all the time. And I would say Feedly is not likely... It, Feedly is likely to burn out, I think, because they they have a very large staff, and they're free... And I assume they're venture funded as as a result of all these things. Um, and generally, companies that are on that trajectory don't stay in it for the long haul. The chances are Feedly is going to either um, shut down or way more likely get bought by somebody and possibly dramatically change the service as a result. You know, a year or two later, or even yeah, or even immediately, they have to monetize it at some point, and any monetization is bound to be annoying. Right. So I, I'm guessing Feedly is gonna. Is gonna like explode quickly and then burn out, and then um, uh, news blur, feed wrangler, and feed bin, I think, are all in it for the long haul, and uh, and we'll see what happens with them. I mean, and and I'm sure there's always gonna be a free option from somebody that gets popular, whether that's Feedly or AOL or Dig. I don't know. Um, I don't know what's gonna you know what's gonna be like in a year, but 
I bet the smaller services that are run by individuals and have sustainable business models will will last a long time. Especially Newsblur has already been around for like four years. So obviously like that's a stable product, right? So we'll see. I was pleased to see though that that your subscriber numbers didn't plummet by virtue of Google Reader going away. And and I think we all kind of figured that would be the case, especially for, for a site like Marco.org. <laughs> I didn't is, figure. Well, I th- I think that there was hope at the very least. And for Marco.org, which caters to nerds, I think you perhaps are seeing um, a, a kind of outside of the normal case uh, situation wherein you'll get a lot of, of subscribers moving to other platforms because we're all nerds. I'm curious to hear for something more mainstream, say like a CNN or something like that, how things change. Because that's not catering to nerds; that's catering to normal humans right. who who may or may not care about this. But only stuff. nerds use RSS, so that's true. Well, I mean, that's not really true. Like, uh, my wife uses RSS in a very odd, she's, in a very different way. She's nerdy yes, by the transitive property of nerdiness. <laughs> she is, but I mean, <laughs> I know regular people that use it. But to your point, it's it's very very frequently a nerd that even has any idea what RSS is, and it's not very regular to see, to hear a regular person talk about it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, these numbers sure are big. You know, like I, I feel like RSS is one of those things that I'm sure I'm sure it's much more talked about and maybe more actively used by nerds. And certainly, of course, there's a whole class of applications that are powered by um, powered by RSS and, and that, that use it in some other way, like Flipboard. Uh, and, and those tend to do way better than anything that just uses RSS kind of raw the way we use it. But um, even if it's just nerds, there's a lot of nerds. Like I, you know, I, I learned this. <laughs> <laughs> I learned this with with my apps. Like, you know, with the magazine, I tried to be less nerdy. I, I tried to broaden past nerds, and not only was it harder than I expected, but I think that was actually a fatal mistake. Um, I think I think it would have done a lot better uh, if I would have just really nailed the nerd market. Um, you know, nerds are a massive market. And and sure, and we are we are the worst customers in the world because we're picky and we're needy and we are entitled and we're and we're generally smart and we think we're really smart and so we will tell you how stupid you are for your app doing a certain thing or not having a certain thing or breaking in a certain way. I mean, nerds are really a terrible market, um, you know, to serve. However, if you are already in it by being a nerd and you are familiar with it and you can appease the nerd market in some small way. There sure are a lot of them. And I, I've, I've always been served very well by serving the nerd market. And whenever I've tried to break out of it, that's when I've had trouble. And, and I can, you know, I've done it. Like Instapaper was not, was not used by all nerds. I mean, there were a lot, as my support email would show, there were a lot of regular non nerd type people using Instapaper and there probably still are. Um, Actually, I know there still are, <laughs> but um, you certainly can't go wrong if 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 you think something will only appeal to nerds. There's still a lot of those, and you're probably wrong. It will still it will pro- like you know one thing that nerds do, which is kind of condescending, uh, and I do it too. You know, I've been guilty of this as well, uh, is that we we underestimate regular people's skills or desires or abilities, and. Certainly, you know, there's reasons to sometimes do that. Like when you're when you're designing an interface or when you're writing the text of a dialogue box, you want to write it so that it will work no matter how smart or not smart or engaged or not engaged the user is. And you know, you you want to like, you know, really be inclusive there and assume nothing about the user's skills. But uh outside of contexts like that, you know, we got to give people credit. And a lot of times I'm very pleasantly surprised by what non-nerds are able to do, especially with some of the crazy crap that nerds build for themselves. And we we think no one else is going to use it. And then people do use it and they figure it out. Uh, I'm always very surprised by that. And so I think it's – I think we should be careful to not not say like, oh, this is just for nerds um, because a lot of times it isn't. Well, Yeah, more than – go ahead, John. I was going to say on RSS, it's not so much that – that there's anything inherently about RSS or what it does that is nerd focused. But I think as Marco probably pointed out, one of his things that he wrote about, like 
it's because it's it's an open standard not owned and controlled by a single company that like that these other companies flee from it because Google wants you to use Google Plus and Facebook wants you to use Facebook and like all these companies are like all right so the web is great and RSS is great and all these protocols that no one owns is great but what if we could do something similar but in a proprietary manner on servers that we control that locks people into our platform and blah 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 you know like they all just want to do all these same things and so you've seen just everything flee from RSS and it's not because people don't want the services provided by that technology nor do they even need to know what RSS exists if you if all companies all embrace this the same way they've essentially been forced to embrace web browsers and every single device you owned came with a first party built by the vendor essential got to be awesome news reading application people would love it people would love to use it it's not like they don't like to read news but it's because they that they, we didn't get past that critical threshold like we did with the web. We're like, look, if you buy a device, it's better have a web browser and it better be a good web browser. And I don't care that you don't control the web because we customers demand it, right? We never got there with RSS. We we seemed like we were close when Apple was adding RSS to all of its things. But if we had gotten there, people would just spend all day in news readers because it's a great way to consume content on the web. Like, it's not that the news reading itself is nerdy. It's that the protocol didn't break through that barrier. And now we're kind of you know, they successfully marginalized it and are trying to bring us all to their stupid proprietary platforms to do all the similar things. Yeah. Uh, and the thing I was going to say, um, also going back a step, is that the the interesting thing about nerds is that once you hit about age 25 or so, more often than not, nerds are willing to spend some money. And they're willing to spend some money on things that make them happy. and Or at least that's the nerds that I interact with, which granted, are all typically Apple users and, and, you know, stereotypes are true for a reason or stereotypes are stereotypes for a reason. And uh, most of my friends and, and family members have come to realize that, you know, a three, four, five dollar app is the cost of one of Marco's beloved Starbucks coffees. And so and they last a lot longer. So Marco catering to nerds is is a lucrative or often a lucrative thing because nerds are willing to spend some money on stuff that makes them happy. And and, and, that, and that's a good thing. They're likely to be gainfully employed as well, because presum- also true. presumably their nerdiness translates into some kind of marketable skill. Right, exactly. And uh, Sam the Geek in the chat is offended that I said it's only the over twenty five nerds, but that that's just a ballpark. <laughs> some of the younger nerds can also pay for things well, the, too. The younger nerds jailbreak and pirate everything. Exactly. <laughs> that's that, that's, that, actually that's what true. I thought. <laughs> that is very true. And on that bomb, are right, you want to wrap it up? <laughs> I think All right. Good. Thanks a lot to our two sponsors this week, Audible and Transporter. Uh, and I'll see you guys next week. Now the show is over. They didn't even mean to begin because it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. John didn't do any research. Marco and Casey wouldn't let him because it was accidental. accidental. Oh, it was accidental. accidental. And you can find the show notes at atp.fm And if you're into Twitter, you can follow them At C-A-S-E-Y-L-I-S-S So that's Casey Liss, M-A-R-C-O-A-R-M-E-N-T Marco Arment, S-I-R-A-C USA Syracuse, it's accidental Anyway. All right, so what are we doing about titles? Oh, I haven't even looked yet. I, I was saving it. It's like, it's like podcast dessert. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to add my two cents on the, the nailing the nerd market. The other big factor, which I think you probably talked about at some point and back to, uh, back, back to work, building analysts that uh, the reason you're going to have an easier time being successful in the nerd market is because it's so much easier to make an application used by people who are like you, right? It's so oh, much definitely. To empathize, right? So you know, it's, it, because you are a nerd, and because you know, presumably software developers have nerdy tendencies. Yes, it's much easier, to, you know, to, to hit the nerd market with nerd applications written by a nerd who understands what nerds like, and is a one man shop. And you don't, you know what I mean? So that's that's also a big factor in there. Oh, absolutely. But you know, a lot of times too, like you know, nerds nerds think of solutions to problems that most people don't even think they have. But a lot of times they do have that problem, and they appreciate the solution once they see it. Well, that's engineering. It's solving a problem you didn't know you had in a way that you don't understand. <laughs> right, exactly. 
Exactly. And so I, I do think there's there's some value. I mean, that's one of the reasons why a lot of nerd stuff does uh, jump the gap into regular people because, you know, I mean, some of the stuff like, you know, if, if you're making a uh, some kind of web sync service to uh, to synchronize your Twitter posts onto the newest social network, so, you know, you, you cross post between Twitter and app.net, that is a problem that normal people don't have and are unlikely to ever have. And so that is going to be limited really only to nerds. Look at something like uh, If This Then That, IFTTT. Great site, great idea. Almost definitely going to stay with nerds, you know, because that it it just it solves a whole class of of problems and desires that mostly only nerds have. Um, but things like Twitter itself, you know, that was something that started out pretty nerdy, um, but it you know it solved a problem that a lot of people had. Just at first, was only known about by nerds, and that's the kind of thing that can break out. Um, that's- that's another thing you can do with that Dropbox API. Synchronize my direct message red state so I don't have to use the Twitter official client, which now I added that feature, but only uh, is my understanding for the official Twitter client, which I don't want to use. Yeah, so, if you want to understand, they, they didn't actually make an API for it. They used to add it themselves. Yeah, they just added it to that. Right. So then it's like, well, fine. You know, it, it, if I use Twitterific on both platforms, if they both talk to the Dropbox thing, like they could also use iCloud Key Value Storage, but that's not cross platform and has size limitations. So just, you know, use this. It's really easy to do with the Dropbox data storage. You're just, you know, yeah have an identifier for the message you just store a big list of them if it's fast and efficient you know go to town so with regard to titles i don't think i care but i would recommend something that relates to dropbox and not something that relates to iwatch so i don't i don't know what that would be but whatever i'm pretty bored of iwatch already even though we don't know about it yet even if it's real or anything about like i'm i'm bored of i'm bored of everyone including us speculating about it just because like it like we just we have we have nothing to work on and it could be something really cool but that's really unlikely and the most likely thing it's going to be is really boring and so i just like i just i'm so burnt out from people talking about it yeah, no, and I again, that includes that. us and me. Even like you know, I, I say this with full self realization that we just talked about it for like twenty five minutes earlier. But uh, it's it just so I don't know. We just we have nothing to work on. You'll, I do you'll be think, reinvig- reinvigorated when it's not a watch, but it's actually a necklace or perhaps an earring. <laughs> then we'll have something to talk about. <laughs> I cannot wait to hear the story of Marco getting his ear pierced in order to wear the eye earring, the Apple tongue stud. <laughs> Oh, God, that'd be terrible. Think of the sensors they could get in there. Holy (laughs) crap. I'm uncomfortable. (laughs) Oh, man. Hey, uh, so in random other news, since Marco came and uh, Marco and his family came to visit this weekend, I've seen his new app, and it is glorious. The new new one or the, like, practice new one? The practice new one. The practice new one. Yeah. Eh, We all saw that. I'm just trolling the chat room right now because they were begging for information about it. And I'm not going to give them any. Well, you know, really underscore David it? Smith saw it too. Are you releasing that or what? It's done, uh, it's, right? It's, it's, a, it. it's awaiting approval. It is it is officially shipped uh, to Apple, but it's awaiting yeah. approval. It's been it's been um, ah, about eight days, so it's not totally unreasonable. I I can tell from my uh, Tapstream analytics. I'm trying Tapstream for the first time here. Um, previous sponsor of my site, disclosure. Um, I can tell from their analytics that there have not been any any new launches of the app uh, since I submitted it. So as far as I can tell, it's not like, you know, hitting some wall that somebody has to ask someone about. Like, it's just waiting in the queue. So we will see. That's interesting. You should write uh, a Mac app because I keep hearing people getting their Mac apps through in like one day. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> well, I mean, but they're, you know, that's such a roller coaster. Like last year... It was, like, it was like, yeah, it was like 45 <laughs> days or something. It was ridiculous. And so, yeah, at least iOS is fairly consistent. It's like it, iOS is pretty much always six to eight days. It's very, un, very rarely outside of those bounds. And when it is, not by much. Uh, so we will see. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just waiting for that to be approved. And then I, I actually just today restarted work on the other big app that will be out this fall, I hope. Um, it's funny, you know, I, I've I've decided that I'm going to require iOS 7 for the new one, but the question is, then when do you release that? 
you know, obviously it's great to get it out there early, but the earlier you get it out there, the fewer people can actually use it. So like if, and, and the more you're competing for the, for press attention and Apple features, um, if you're trying to get out there, like the week of iOS seven's launch, no, you, 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 I think you want to be out on launch. Like you want, you definitely want to be out on launch. Like it's, I, know, I know all the downsides, but the downsides all have nothing to do with the number of sales you're getting it and everything to like you, I think, as soon as people get an iOS 7 device, they're going to want to put applications on it that show off iOS 7 and that are sort of iOS 7 savvy to use the old System 7 uh, term. And you want yours to be one of those things. Because that's, I think that's a big foot in the door. If you think about all the people who were like that on day one on the iPad or day one on the iPhone app store, uh, I think that's a huge advantage. Yeah, that's true. That, that might work. Yeah, I'll have, I'll have to see. Uh, I, I mean, mean it's, a ni- it's a nightmare scramble to do that. Right. And you end up shipping something that is not in the state and perhaps that you would want to ship it. But I still think, like, I mean, you're going to work on the application. It's going to improve, even if that first version is new. People are just going to go through, like, I just want to buy like Like in the iPad launch, I've got a new iPad. Which applications are iPad savvy? Put them on here. I really do wonder also, though, how many people are going to hold off upgrading on 7 because it is so different. And certainly there's going to be a lot of backlash when it launches from people who want things back the old way. And, uh, and so I'm, I wonder, like, I don't think it's going to be a big delay for people, but I bet there will be something. I bet we'll hear it. Like, you know, every, every time there's a new iPhone or iOS release, but especially a new iPhone release, every time there's some kind of stupid consumer reports scandal about some part of it that everyone doesn't like. And, uh, I think it's going to be iOS seven that's falling. I think that's going to be like the big Apple scandal is like, Oh my God, nobody likes iOS seven and no one can figure out how to use it. Even though it's, you know, it takes like a minute to get used to. But, yeah. But all the, the 5 million people who buy the iPhone five S or whatever the hell in the holiday season, right. those people are going to have to be stuck with iOS seven and they'll buy your application. Yeah. Well, I, we'll have to probably say this for next show. I, I am curious to talk about Apple's fall lineup. Um, yeah, let, let's save that for next show. All right. Because this looks like there's a lot coming and possibly like all in the same month. Uh, if I were you, John, I would maybe get your review done for September. Yeah, no. I know all about it. I know all about it. <laughs> so angry. I can say so slow going, so freaking slow. I just look at it and I'm just, this is, I'm on the phase where I'm like, this is never going to be finished. It was literally John, never. You I'm know, maybe finish. if you gave up on all your other podcasts and actually worked on, on it's this not the podcast, instead. it's the nine <laughs> to five give, job. It I'm really, you a really time. takes time away. Let me tell you. No, I, I'm, I'm just giving you a hard time. So to continue darting around between topics, uh, Ice Vix <laughs> from a 16 year old perspective says, or from a 16 year old perspective, most kids seem to like it except for the UI change, the main change. And there are very few that don't like it. So what is there that one would like? that isn't the UI change because no normal 16 year old has any idea what the well, hell, but 16 year olds don't write articles. It's grumpy old men who write That's articles true. in those stupid <laughs> magazines that are like, well, my phone changed and everything's all white. Ah. And I can't read the text cause it's too thin. And there there'll be legitimate some complaints mixed in with the fear of change mixed in with the blah, blah, blah. But I, I don't know if the back, I think hopefully we're getting through all the backlash now. Uh, and by the time it ships, it'll be like, well, we're used to it. It's all right. You want, do you want to pick a title? Oh, you know, I, one thing I do like, which John mentioned very quickly in passing, the transitive property of nerdiness. Is that too long? That is I good. like it. I do like that as well. You should Google that to make sure I use the right word. As <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to my tweet old. about Googling embarrassing questions. Much better to Google the answers <laughs> okay. than to not. I'm pretty sure that's correct. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's correct, too, but this is exactly the type of thing. Yeah, I'm almost 100% certain it's correct, and yet the internet is sitting there saying, why don't you just ask me? I have the actual answer. <laughs> like, why not Why not double-check? That's why writing this freaking review takes forever, because every single thing I write in there, I'm like, you know what, let me check that. You know what, let John, me check have that. have you ever You know been what, let me check that. And you anything? find out you're, you're on a five-minute diversion to check some fact that you are like 99.9% sure is correct, but you have to prove it before you can go on with the sentence. Anyway. Have you ever been wrong about anything ever? Now, that's what kills me at the reviews. Like, I look, you know... You all, I like see is, all I see is right the one are. the one fact that I didn't check that I got wrong. The, like the, <laughs> the, the you know the name of this machine, the release date, date of this thing, or the price is off by a dollar because I didn't check it because I was just going by memory, and it just kills me. Here, here's the problem, John. Here's the problem you have is that that Retina MacBook Pro that showed up in Geekbench uh, a few days ago was running Mavericks. Do you see why that's a problem? 
it's uh, I, I I know <laughs> when I when they say fall, I try to be ready by the first day of fall. Like I don't I'm not no dummy. I know how, how this thing goes. I don't assume it's going to be the middle or end of fall. I assume it's going to be in the first day of fall, and that's what I'm still shooting for. But I'm thinking so, yeah. we have two big events. We have an iOS event and we have a Mac event. I'm thinking those are separate events. The iOS event happens later, more likely November, because iOS 7 needs a lot of time. Uh, iOS 7 is nowhere near done. However, I'm thinking that the Mac event might happen as early as September, and that Mavericks comes out then, along with the Mac Pro, new Retina MacBook Pros, and maybe an iMac refresh. I think they'll delay the Mac Pro because, like, well, the Retina screens aren't ready, so, you know, the Mac Pro will have more to say about that later in the year because... Back to the old, they can't resist. It's like, you know what? Screw those macros. <laughs> we'll get it out in the fall. December 19th, we'll, we'll, you know, because like, like they're holding the Mac Pro. We all hope they're holding it with some, some monitors too. So even if they're not, they'll just be like, you know what? Screw the Mac Pro. But that's, that's one's going to wait. We've got to hire all those Americans to build it or something. <laughs> well, the Mac Pro right now, they can't release it now because Intel doesn't, it hasn't released those CPUs yet, presumably in volume. Like, you know, the, the, the official delivery date of those CPUs is September. And it's the same delivery date for many of the uh, Haslab parts in volume, I believe. I'm not sure on that part, but, um, you know, obviously they're holding back the Retina MacBook Pro for some reason. The, the, the Mac Pro also has to wait to Mavericks. All these new Macs have to wait for Mavericks. Like they're not going to bother. They're not going to bother getting them to, to right. work correctly with with Mountain Line because there's no big rush in the Mac Pro. Like people have waited so long already. What's the big deal? And yeah, you know. right. Same thing with with the Retinas, but yeah. That also means there we're probably not talking November here. We're probably talking September. Yeah, I know. I'm I'm, all, yeah, I'm planning on it. I'm trying to get it done. <laughs> well, October's after September last I checked. I know, so but you never know then. because the wild card is maybe it's such a mad scramble for iOS seven, which is do or die, that they pull everybody off everything and it's like everyone just get iOS seven done and then when this you know, and then go back to what you were doing and then Mavericks get delayed just because due to sheer neglect. Because everyone, everyone was pulled off to work on iOS 7 because they have – like that is far from done and they have to get that done. Oh, yeah. Well, I, honestly, I think they're just going to ship whatever the hell they have you know, yeah, in, yeah. in mid-November or whatever it is. Like they're just going to ship it, period. Know, like, but, like, whatever they this, have at that point, that's what 7.0. Like, you can do that with iOS 6 and 5 where they just cut off features. But like they can't have a disaster where everyone gets their phones on Christmas morning and there's some fatal bug. that Like they just can't have that. It's It's a problem. So they have to – they have to ship what they have, but they also have to make sure that what they have is stable, like does not have any fatal flaws. And that's really hard to do when you're making a mad scramble. Like, Well, they're, just... they're already almost to that point, though. Like like be- between betas 2 I-, – I didn't use beta 1 much, but between beta 2 and 3, um, there's already a significant reduction in reboots. And... Well, a reduction in reboots is not <laughs> – Well, with yeah. 3, I haven't seen 1. With 2, I All would right. see about 1 a day. Um, with three, I haven't seen any yet. I mean, it's only I've only had it for a few days so far. It's not, but it's not, not burning your battery. It's not failing to sync something like so many things. Yeah, it, no, it's honestly, so much easier like, when you're doing most of the bugs that remain in iOS seven right now are just like minor UI problems. Like, oh, this label disappears, or you know, the status bar appears rotated in the wrong way on the screen. Like, it's it's minor UI quirks that yeah, they suck and they're definitely bugs. But that's you know. If they ship with that, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Yeah, no, no data loss, no, no uh, crashes, no phone reboots, and no failure to do some essential function like convey text messages or synchronize something or get mail or you know skipping mail messages. <laughs> right. No, I mean, I, I have no doubts that they will be able to get something out there that is stable and doesn't have major bugs like that by November. Um, I suspect that seven point is going to have still some weird little edge case UI bugs just because there are so many new UIs and so many of them are uh, not quite baked yet. But the the solid, like, you know, like the kernel is fine. I'm sure like Springboard will be pretty much fine. You know, like the all the really important stuff, the, the common stuff, the underlying stuff, that'll all I think be fine uh, by November because it's already almost fine now. Well, and plus, I mean, everything I've read on on Twitter says that Mavericks is good to go immediately. You know, they're ready. So even if there's a grant, well, which means, John, you're f- uh, but- I, don't, I wouldn't say that. My, when I come back to my Mavericks laptop, it is after a night. Uh, I put it to sleep. 
I put the, the Mac laptop to sleep, and then I go to bed and I come back down in the morning, and the thing is usually awake, fans on, but totally hard hung. So oh. maybe maybe it's not maybe it's not ready yet. Fair enough. 